Good morning. I'm Zinclair Samoa in for Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a race against time in California. Search and rescue teams working around the clock to dig out the snowbound in SoCal. People now braving snow drifts of nearly 10 feet to help deliver vital supplies like food, water, and medications to those still trapped. We're on the ground with the latest conditions as yet another storm system gears up off the Pacific Coast. Take it. New developments this morning surrounding those four Americans kidnapped at gunpoint shortly after crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. The FBI now asking for the public's help, offering a $50,000 reward for the group's safe return. One law enforcement official calling it a case of mistaken identity. We've got the latest. Also this morning, safety first. For many college students, March means spring break, and officials in hotspot Florida are now hard at work bracing for an influx of unruly partiers cracking down on violence to make sure seasons of a pandemic past don't repeat. We begin this hour with desperate calls for help from communities in rural California. They're still struggling after a severe winter storm brought several feet of snow to the mountains just east of Los Angeles. Rescue teams are now going door to door to rescue those stranded. And for others, the process to dig through the snow has only just begun. But with limited supplies and widespread damage, many say they're already exhausted. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us now from Crestline, California, with more on the severe conditions. Miguel, good morning. Hey, hey guys, good morning. This home, this neighborhood really is symbolic of what we're seeing all across the mountains a few hours outside of Los Angeles. There's actually several cars here behind me that are buried in snow. And as you can see here, the front lawn, just mounds of snow everywhere. There's actually concern here at this home that that roof could collapse because of all of the weight of the snow. Now, the gentleman who lives here does finally have power and food, but it's going to take him days to dig out. This morning, this is the race to reach the snowbound in Southern California. Emergency teams digging out trapped residents in the San Bernardino Mountains, just 80 miles east of L.A. Homes and cars submerged in snow drifts more than nine feet tall. Feels like an apocalyptic movie. In the last two weeks alone, over 7 million cubic yards of snow cleared from state highways, the equivalent of more than 2,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. But many side roads here are still undrivable. Without us volunteers, there's no telling how many dead bodies would be recovering. Middle school teacher Steve Gaskell serving as a literal lifeline, scaling the snow to deliver food and medications to stranded residents like Marissa Cupsick, okay. including insulin for her uncle. It's just scary not being able to get out. How desperate did you need these supplies, including that insulin? Oh, it's a matter of life or death for my uncle. Pregnant mom Stephanie Gillis and her husband David were trapped in their home when she went into labor. Road closures preventing their midwives from arriving in time. That's when things started to get a little stressful for me. Luckily, Stephanie gave birth to a healthy baby girl, Audrey, without complications. Meantime, Northern California also facing dangerous conditions. Heavy snow in the Sierra Nevada collapsing roofs and making travel treacherous. Yosemite National Park and over a dozen state parks closed indefinitely as Californians come together to help brave this historic winter wallow. Now, there is some good news. Most of the major roads here have been plowed, but the side roads and so many driveways have not. Take a look at this Corvette. It is encased in snow and ice. It'll take weeks likely to dig this car out. Now, the other major concern in this area is the cold temperatures and folks without power and heat. That could be a life and death scenario. Joe, guys, back to you guys. Brand people stay safe. Miguel Almaguer, thank you. Let's stick with the weather and get your morning news now forecast. Angie Lastman has more on what to expect this week. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, guys. And for California, adding insult to injury, where we have a couple of systems that we're going to watch move on shore, bring um, more moisture, more snow, more rain. So let's start there. We'll start on the West Coast, where there's some showers working in, focused mainly for Northern California and points up into Washington and Oregon along the coast. We do have a couple of snow showers working through as well, but most of it is uh, few and far between. We do have those winter weather alerts in 
effect, though, right now, and here's why. We have a couple of systems that are in work on shore. That first one is the culprit for these kind of scattered rain showers and snow showers that are focused, again, into northern California and up into places like Portland and Seattle. Uh, but then we'll have a secondary system that starts to gear up, intensify, and really impact a whole lot more people here as we get into the end of the week. This system spreads some of that snow off to the northern Rockies, so we'll add some snow to folks that live there. We'll see some rain showers, but the big uh, push of moisture happens with this next, next system. It, we are looking at another atmospheric river event, so that means more moisture, more flooding concerns, more snow, all of that on the table for folks uh, on the west coast here as we get through Thursday and Friday. This is into Thursday. There's that system still offshore, but look at all this moisture that it's attached to it. That's going to swing in and add on to those totals of uh, that they've already had, really incredible totals in some spots. Uh, some of those spots, the Sierras, ending up with another one to three feet when it's all said and done through Thursday. Mount Shasta, another one to two feet. And on top of that, with some of that, we'll see some melt, and we also have some rainfall that we're going to expect. So anywhere one, maybe two inches in some of those locations along the coast. Uh, so we'll watch for the flooding concerns for folks there. Meanwhile, in the northeast, some of those snow showers we saw this morning are ending, but we're going to be left with some chilly temperatures. New York, 41 degrees. It'll feel like the 30s. Rochester into the low 30s. It'll feel like the 20s. We do have some uh, breezy conditions, so just make sure that you are prepared for that. Meanwhile, it's the opposite on the Gulf Coast, guys. We're more record temperatures for them. Not <laughs> that breezy is the, there. Yeah, <laughs> that's the place to be, apparently. Exactly. <laughs> Angie Lassman, thank you. That two of those Americans caught in that kidnapping on Friday are now dead, and that two others are alive, but one of them is wounded. The governor did add that the uh, Americans are in the custody of Mexican officials, but this comes now on day four after this horrific crime took place, just really a stone's throw across the river from where I'm standing. Uh, when these four Americans, according to their family members, made the drive from South Carolina here to Brownsville, Texas, because a woman in that group wanted to undergo a cosmetic procedure in neighboring Matamoros. Uh, but according to federal officials, it was just almost immediately after crossing, they took gunfire as a result, according to officials, of mistaken identity. Uh, as a result of that, we did see this horrifying video of gunmen uh, unnamed at this hour to any particular group or cause, uh, dragging individuals into a pickup truck and then leaving the scene uh, of that shooting turned kidnapping. Uh, there was so many unknowns, there were so many unknowns as to where these Americans were being taken, uh, as to who took them, that remains. Uh, but uh, unfortunately here within the last hour or so, uh, we, we have heard that they are, we doubt, now know where those Americans are, but unfortunately two lives. According According to the Mexican governor, uh, have been lost. And Morgan, there are some key questions here that I'm going to assume we don't know the answers to at this point. First of all, do we know if anyone's in custody? Second, do we know how on earth those two who are still alive are even now in the custody of Mexican authorities and that they are safe right now? We do know that according to Mexican authorities, they mentioned one detainee. They did not elaborate beyond that. Uh, they have been working hand in hand with the FBI. There is a chance we hear from the FBI later today to clarify some of those unknowns. Uh, they've been involved in this situation since it took place on Friday. Uh, and I, I should add that uh, simply because we know where these Americans now are, uh, this, this investigation is only beginning into finding, according to officials, those responsible uh, and bringing them to justice. Joe? And Mike, let's bring you in here because Matamoros is not exactly considered a safe place to be. I understand the State Department has a do not travel warning for that area. So what are you hearing from officials in Washington? Yeah, that's right, Zinclair. This has been a, a place that the U.S. officials have been constantly warning Americans is not the kind of place that they want to travel to, especially for these kinds of uh, voluntary medical procedures, as we understand that this case involved. Uh, at this point, we are out to the White House to see if they have any new reaction to the fact that we now know that there is a loss of life involving those Americans. But yesterday, we had heard from the White House Press Secretary, Corrine Jean-Pierre, calling these kinds of assaults, these kidnappings, unacceptable. She said that there 
there were U.S. Uh, uh, embassy officials as well as our regional consulates who were engaging with their Mexican counterparts. For the primary level of contact at this point has been uh, law enforcement to law enforcement. Uh, Morgan mentioned it, the FBI working with Mexican counterparts to try to do what they can, first and foremost, to rescue these Americans, to bring them back home safely. Now you go into a question of whether there will be consequences, how Americans respond in this case. But it's interesting to note that the, the contact level at this point has been far below the level of the president. And you can see this now that it does involve a loss of life, potentially escalating to involve a higher level. You'll remember it was just two months ago, I was in Mexico City with President Biden. He was attending uh, what's called the North American Leaders Summit, uh, meeting with the president of Mexico as well as the Canadian prime minister. We looked at that summit primarily through the lens of immigration, the president stopping uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border on the way to Mexico City. But this issue of crime has been one of the top items on the agenda as well. The attorney general, Merrick Garland, was part of the U.S. delegation that had traveled to Mexico City with the president, part of an effort to urge the Mexican government to do much more to try to clamp down on gang violence, cartel violence, like we're seeing in this case. You'll remember on the eve of the president's arrival in Mexico City, there was a high-level capture uh, by the Mexican authorities of Ovidio Guzman, the son of El Chapo. That was seen as an effort, a symbolic effort on the part of the Mexican government to show the Americans that they were taking this gang violence seriously and trying to clamp down. But this has been a major concern of American officials that the new Mexican government in particular has not been willing uh, to be as aggressive in, in pursuing uh, these uh, uh, cartels, not just because of the flow of illegal guns, uh, the flow of illegal drugs primarily, uh, but because of what it means just for the safety of ordinary uh, Mexicans, of course, uh, in those countries, but uh, in those uh, parts of Mexico, but also, of course, to Americans who travel uh, to Mexico as well. And we should note here, we are hearing from the president of Mexico saying, we are looking for those responsible. They will be punished. That came from a news conference earlier from the president of Mexico. Mike Memoli, thank you so much. Now, also. Ukraine's president Zelensky has vowed to keep defunding, to keep defending, excuse me, the eastern city of Bakhmut, the scene of one of the war's fiercest battles. Russian forces aided by the mercenary Wagner Group have been pushing hard over the past few months to gain what could be an important foothold in the Donbass region. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now with the latest on all this. So Matt, we have been following the fighting in Bakhmut for some time now. Where do things stand right now? Do Ukrainians really think they can hold on to it? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because, of course, things stand more or less where they stood almost a year ago when this battle first started. As you mentioned, Joe, this has been one of the fiercest battles and one of the longest battles of what is now a war that has extended far beyond a year now. Uh, and it's been going on for almost that entire year. Now, we're seeing both sides almost evenly matched, losing a lot of materiel and a lot of personnel. This has been a very lethal fight, and yet both sides seem determined to hold on. Now, the state of the front is that it's the Wagner group on the Russian side that has been leading this fight, and we heard that is a group that is essentially a private army that is led by an oligarch who is a close friend of Vladimir Putin. This man, and this is a name to remember, you've probably heard this before. His name is Yevgeny Prigozhin, and he has been complaining, publicly airing his grievances with the Kremlin and with the Ministry of Defense in Russia for not providing his private army with enough weapons, he says, to fight off the Ukrainians. He says that this could be something like treason or sabotage, that the Ukrainian military doesn't want to see him, excuse me, the Russian military doesn't want to see his private army succeed, where the Russian military has shown itself time and time again to have failed. So this fight for Bakhmut, it's not just a fight about Russian prestige in taking a city, which they haven't done for nearly the past year. This is about Prigozhin himself elevating himself within the ranks of the military and the defense establishment in the Kremlin. And in doing so, he's opening up a lot of fissures within the Kremlin and within the leadership. Guys. <laughs> And Matt, the Russians clearly believe this would be an important gain. Their defense minister said it would allow for further offensive action inside Ukraine. But interestingly, the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin appeared to actually downplay its significance while on tour in the Middle East. So what exactly did he say about it? 
Yeah, I mean, Lloyd Austin, along with much of the U.S. and really all the Western defense establishment, Western military analysts, everybody who looks at this battle wonders why on the, both the Ukrainian and the Russian sides, both sides are willing to lose so many men and materiel to fight for a city, Bakhmut, that isn't necessarily seen as particularly important or strategically necessary to win what is Russia's goal of taking most of the eastern Donbass region, those two major provinces in the eastern part of the country that for many people there who live there, they do identify identify as Russian. So, you know, this is a battle that has been going on for so long, and it seems like it's taken on an outsized proportion. And, you know, Lloyd Austin made these comments just the other day. Here's what he said. If the Ukrainians uh, decide to reposition um, in, the, in some of the terrain that's, that's west of Bakhmut, uh, I would not view that as, a, as an operational or a strategic uh, setback. I think it's more of a symbolic uh, value than it is uh, strategic and operational value. So the fall of Bakhmut won't necessarily mean that uh, that uh, the Russians are have changed the title of uh, the title of this fight. Well, then, so as you can see, this is why this comment from President Vladimir Zelensky and the Ukrainians was so interesting, because you have the Westerners, the main patrons, the U.S., the main patrons of the Ukrainian military in the whole war fighting against the Russians, whispering in the Ukrainians' ears, saying, give up, Bakhmut. Don't fight for it. You're losing too much for too little. Guys? All right. Matt Bradley, Matt, thank you so much. Back in the U.S., some scary moments aboard a flight into Boston. Authorities say a passenger on board a United plane tried to open an emergency door mid-flight and then allegedly attacked a flight attendant. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has more on this terrifying story. Hey there. The alarming incident played out just minutes before the plane was set to land in Boston. Federal prosecutors say that passenger repeatedly tried to stab a flight attendant, but thankfully some fast-acting passengers and crew members jumped in to stop him. This morning, a United Airlines passenger is facing federal charges following a terrifying incident on board a Boston-bound flight. I will kill every man on this plane. According to court documents, about 45 minutes before landing the cross-country trip from Los Angeles, the flight crew was notified that an emergency exit door on the plane had been disarmed. A flight attendant discovered the door's handle had been moved out of the fully locked position. Another flight attendant reporting 33-year-old Francisco Torres had been near the door, leading the crew to believe he had tampered with it. When confronted, Torres allegedly responded asking if there were cameras to prove it. Witnesses say that's when he got out of his seat, approached two flight attendants in the aisle, and allegedly attempted to stab one of them in the neck three times with a broken metal spoon. We started hearing his voice get louder and louder. He was clearly agitated. Passengers on board the plane, seen in this video shared by witness Lisa Olson, tackled and restrained the suspect. There were probably four or five men that... Um, restrained him on the ground. Torres later admitting to investigators he knew if he opened the door, many people would die. Also claiming self-defense during the altercation, saying he made the weapon on board in the bathroom. Just how unusual is this degree of violence? It's extraordinarily unusual, but it doesn't take that much to take a lot of everyday items and turn them into weapons. It comes as we're learning new details about Torres. In 2015, he was ordered by a court to undergo a psychiatric evaluation, according to a lawsuit he filed against a hospital years later, in which he alleged he was misdiagnosed with a mental health disorder. In that suit, Torres, who represented himself, sought $50 billion and a license to carry and use, if necessary, any type concealed or unconcealed firearms and explosives on any commercial transports. The case was later dismissed. United Airlines says it has has zero tolerance for any type of violence on our flights, adding this customer will be banned from flying on United pending an investigation. If convicted, Torres could face life in prison. The Flight Attendants Union continues to call on Congress to require a list of nationally banned disruptive passengers and says incidents like this put everyone at risk. Back to you. Emily, thanks so much. And coming up on this hour of Morning News Now, the White House is out this morning with a new plan to save Medicare coverage for millions of Americans. We'll dig deeper into President Biden's new proposal set to be formally released today and the pushback it's expected to receive from Republicans. We'll be right back. 
This morning, the Biden administration is announcing a proposal to raise taxes on those making $400,000 or more a year. The goal, to boost funding for Medicare. Now, under the plan, the Medicare tax rate for those earners would rise from 3.8% to 5%, and the program's ability to negotiate lower costs for prescription drugs would be expanded. In an op-ed in the New York Times, the president called the tax hike a means to, quote, extend Medicare for another generation. President Biden says he hopes this plan, which is part of the 2024 budget he'll release later this week will be able to extend the program through 2050. Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now from the White House with more. Peter, good morning. So what can you tell us about this? Walk us through the president's plan and how ambitious is it? Well, it's particularly ambitious given the fact that the president obviously no longer has Democrats leading the Chamber of Commerce, uh, excuse me, the, the House, which is now run by Republicans. So it's unlikely to go anywhere. He is, however, previewing, Joe, this top priority in, in the budget. As you say, he'll release it this week, proposing hiking taxes on Americans making more than $400,000 a year. It would allow the government uh, this new power to negotiate drug prices. All of it, part of what the White House says, is its effort to really extend that key Medicare program and to keep it solvent through 2050, so for at least another 25 years. This latest push obviously comes as the president's facing a possible showdown uh, with Republicans over the debt ceiling, government funding as well. Republicans have obviously been eyeing big cuts in federal spending. They haven't identified what those cuts would be. But again, just to be clear, the president's plan really does have very little chance of becoming law. This is in many ways more about messaging, especially with Republicans now in control of the House. But his budget is important. It does sort of signal a likely starting point for the negotiations on government spending. The re proposed changes here to Medicare's ability to negotiate prescription drug prices, were they to happen, they would certainly benefit seniors, reducing what those seniors pay out of pocket, Joe, according to the White House, and it would cap the cost of some generic drugs. Medicare is always going to be a big budget headline, but looking ahead, are we expecting anything else major from the budget later this week? I think uh, you can anticipate you'll hear more in terms of an effort to try to raise taxes on some of America's wealthiest during his recent State of the Union. The president called on Congress to pass his proposal for a billionaire's minimum tax. This would likely be similar to a proposal that he had laid out just a year ago that called for uh, a 20 percent minimum income tax on those multimillionaires and billionaires. The president says it's only fair that the wealthiest Americans don't pay less than teachers and police officers and nurses. That billionaire Billionaires tax would apply to households with more than $100 million, the top, not 1%, but 1 100th of a percent. That's maybe 700 of the wealthiest families in the country. And officials say it could be critical, though, that it could create an extra $350 billion in tax revenue over the next decade. Uh, but, Joe, again, to be clear here, Republicans oppose any tax increases. So it's very unlikely any of this comes to pass. All right. Peter Alexander at the White House. Thank you, Peter. And this morning, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is, is in Iraq on an unannounced visit as part of his Middle East tour. Austin is the most senior official in the Biden administration to make the trip, which comes 20 years after the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Tens of thousands of Iraqi civilians died in the war, and the ensuing instability eventually led to the rise of ISIS. Speaking in Baghdad, Austin said the U.S. was committed to Iraq's security and fight against terrorism, adding the U.S. would maintain a military presence in the country. We're deeply committed to ensuring that the Iraqi people can live in peace and dignity, with safety and security, and with e economic opportunity for all. The U.S. forces are, are ready to remain in Iraq at the invitation of the government of Iraq. Now, these forces are operating in a non-combat, advise, assist, and enable role to support the Iraqi-led fight against terrorism. More international news now, and the launch of a new rocket in Japan did not go quite as planned. NBC News correspondent Claudio Labanga joins us now for more on this. Claudio, good morning. Good morning. Yes, the space agency in Japan says that the launch of its new flagship space rocket failed uh, this morning after or when controllers issued a distract command literally 15 minutes after liftoff. The rocket was carrying the advanced land observation satellite, a ground mapping and imaging satellite that the space agency said was planned to become a key tool in disaster management efforts in Japan and abroad. 
Now to the Philippines, where on Monday, jeepneys drivers went on a week-long strike, causing major disruption in several cities. Jeepneys are former military jeeps left behind by the U.S. after the Second World War, turned into a cheap mean of transport and are crucial, crucial and popular parts of the transport system there. The strike was prompted by the request by the government to replace them with a more modern alternatives, as they say the vehicles are damaging to the environment. And finally, take a look at what archaeologists unearthed in an ancient temple in southern Egypt. Egypt's Antiquities Ministry said that a sphinx-like statue and the remains of a shrine were among artifacts that were found in the temple of Dendera, about 300 miles from Cairo. And guess who archaeologists believe the statue represents? Claudius, or Claudio, the Roman, em the Roman emperor who ruled over North Africa and has inspired countless of Italian parents ever since to call their children Claudio, including mine, of course. <laughs> yes. Fantastic name. All right. Indeed. Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Coming up on Morning News Now, safety first. They're bracing for another rowdy spring break in Florida this year, hoping that the violence and unrest of years past doesn't repeat. After the break, we'll show you how people there are preparing as the parties kick off. Stick around. We're back now with an alarming trend that more educators are choosing to leave their profession. School districts say they're seeing spikes in teacher turnover. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now with a look at what this means for students across the country. Good morning. It's not great news, guys. Good morning. You know, there was hope last fall that the teacher shortage would start to improve after a tough stretch during the pandemic. But some new numbers this morning tell a different story. It's not better. And in some places, the shortages are getting worse. Across the country, fed up teachers, many tired of long hours and low pay, are calling it quits. In one Virginia county, they are hoping a $3,000 bonus will keep teachers from leaving the job. Our teachers work hard, our staff works hard, and they need to be fairly compensated. But they are down more than 150 teachers. It's a similar story in school districts across the country. New numbers from eight states show how tough things are getting. Last school year, Maryland and Louisiana saw the highest number of resignations in a decade. In Washington state, it was the highest number in three decades. When everything shut down and COVID kind of took full swing, that was my first year in the classroom. Angela Tilson resigned from her teaching job in Massachusetts last December. COVID is still very much affecting the education system. The gaps are striking and there's only so much that you can do as one person in the overload of work. It sounds like you reached a real breaking point. Yes, I did. Like many, she shared her story online. There are a mix of reasons. I am not going to miss unreasonable class sizes. I am not going to miss 23 minute lunch breaks. Children are struggling academically. Teacher shortages mean more work. And then there's the pay. Today was my last day as a teacher. I'd like to think it's just a pause, but I honestly don't know right now. In the fall, Sayreville, New Jersey, sent out flyers hoping to inspire people to help. Three retired teachers returned to the job, but the district still has 12 vacancies. We were starting to experience a little bit of the shortage last year, but uh, it seems that we hit the pinnacle this year. Did it get worse? Without a doubt. The key educators say is getting young college students to choose the profession. Our message to them is you couldn't ask for a more noble field. Um, you know, if you really want to make an impact on this world, this is where it's to be done. That is for sure. You know, there are a lot of states taking steps to offer more money, including helping teachers pay down those student loans. Some of the COVID rescue plan can be also be used to help school districts, but that assistance is temporary. And what's needed, educators say, is a long-term solution, guys. And pay is going to be a big part of that. Huge yeah. part of it. It's so yeah. important for the students. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. And spring break season is upon us, and that means beach towns and resorts will be seeing a surge in travelers between now and mid-April. In recent years, the spring break celebrations have been disruptive for cities like Miami Beach and Fort Lauderdale, but city officials are taking action this year to make sure the festivities don't get out of hand. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Cocoa Beach, Florida with the details. Yeah, Cocoa Beach, Florida. Here we are, Zinc Lake. Good morning. Very good to be with you. And certainly, you know, as you mentioned a second ago, it's been eventful the last couple of years. The hope is that past is not prologue in this case, although very calm in Cocoa Beach. Officials here at the Westgate 
Cocoa Beach Pier. This is a historic pier here. Say that lots of people like to come down here to eat, have a good drink, and also listen to live music. They are going to be ramping up police presence here, but really the issue, guys, is to my south in Miami Beach. That is what's under the microscope, as they're expecting potentially up to 50,000 visitors a day, as the mayor of Miami Beach says he has zero tolerance for violence. In Miami Beach, the calm before the spring break storm. I wanted to catch it before spring break um, so I could just have a nice quiet time. Florida is the nation's top spring break destination this year, according to AAA, thanks to the Sunshine State's theme parks, cruise ship ports, and over 800 miles of coastline. This is the place to be. Everyone comes down here to party, to relax, to experience the beach and stuff. But with that popularity comes some challenges. Miami Beach Mayor Dan Gelber wants visitors to enjoy the vacation haven, but avoid a repeat of the past two years. What is the curfew right now? We don't have a curfew. But that could change. It could change if, if, if circumstances require us to do something to keep people safe. In 2022, local officials forced to declare a state of emergency, including a midnight curfew after unruly behavior and several shootings plagued the city during spring break. Don't come here and do stupid things or criminal things because it, it's going to be bad for you and bad for us. Just a 30-minute train ride away in Fort Lauderdale. We all know spring break, it's going to be crazy. Authorities reminding spring breakers alcohol is banned from public beaches through April 2nd, along with coolers, tents, and loud music. Unfortunately, this time of year, uh, we, we see uh, a lot of injuries uh, that are alcohol related. At the nation's airports, the TSA is anticipating an upward trend in travel volume this spring break, possibly exceeding pre pandemic levels. Tampa's airport expecting a record number of travelers. I like to refer to spring break as the Super Bowl for the airport. In the Orlando area, officials expect more than 7 million to fly in and out over that time frame. In Cocoa Beach, it's already lively on an early March Monday. Just in terms of the economic vitality of, of this particular city, though, how important is spring break? Very important. It's one of the busiest times of the year for Cocoa Beach. Spring breakers dreaming of sunshine being urged to pack some common sense. And Miami Beach has, guys, more than 400 police officers. They are all going to be working extended hours this month and pulling in fellow officers from adjoining agencies to try to make sure there's a heavy police presence. They'll be on ATVs and horseback. The mayor of Miami Beach even telling me they're using cell phones to figure out, and this is, of course, generic cell phone information, how many people are on their, on their island at any given point in time. If they need to take action, they'll have a sense of the flow that's going on. Zinkley and Joe, back to you. Hoping people stay safe. Sam, thank you. Out of concerning medical news that could impact millions of young Americans, a new report from the Journal of the American Medical Association shows that obesity and diabetes are on the rise in that group. The study found that the prevalence of diabetes jumped from 3% to 4.1%, while obesity increased from 32.7% to 40.9%. Joining us now to talk about this is Dr. Rocio salas Whalen. She's the physician of endocrinology at NYU Langone Hospital. Doctor, good morning. Thank you for being here. So good first morning. off, why are we seeing this trend, this spike in obesity and diabetes among young adults, and what can be done about it? Definitely. So, and, and just to say, this study was made even before COVID. Mm. So all these numbers that we have is before COVID. So after COVID, those numbers are definitely going to be higher. So there's increase of uh, sedentarism, uh, uh, food industry, uh, less access to health care. Uh, and just obesity itself, we're seeing a very high rise in the prevalence of obesity and diabetes, both of them. And looking at that, I mean, the study also found those most at risk were black, Hispanic, Mexican Americans. Why is it these groups are the most at risk? There's no access to health care, right? And also access to healthy food, access to a healthier environment. They're, they're really exposed since a young age to processed food, ultra processed food. Uh, so it's just an accumulation of the years without any proper access. Like food deserts, things like that, right? Exactly. Mm. And doctor, those behind the study specifically said that these results, quote, highlight the need to intensify public health and clinical interventions focused on primordial and primary prevention for young adults. So what prevent, uh, excuse me, what preventative measures do you think need to happen and be put in place to stop this trend? But also, what are the consequences for young adults as they age? Definitely. So we know that cardiovascular disease is 
it's, I, if it starts at a younger age, then there's definitely more complications, increased risk of mortality, disability, decreased quality of life, right? So we're trying to be very proactive and prevent at a younger age so that patients, even at a younger age, because this study was up to age 44, so it's still young people, right? So we're trying to avoid like serious complications long term. And what can be prevented, I think, is more education, right? Education of diseases, of treatment. Now we can treat obesity, which is great. Access for people that are don't have health insurance um, and medic access to medication, access to healthy food, right? I think the food industry is a very big culprit of the obesity and diabetes rise that we have. These are big, giant, sweeping societal changes that we're talking about. Of course, we have to make that. That takes time. It takes conversations like the ones we're having. For those who are just the individual sitting at home worried about this right now, what's just some of the individual advice you give people about what it is they need to do to just be as healthy as possible when it comes to avoiding See this? your doctor. Talk to a doctor, right, and see what can you be done preventative. I think general, a doctor visit once a year is going to be great because if anything is abnormal, blood pressure, glucose, weight, it can be assessed and treated on time before the complications develop, right? So we're talking about prevention. So those measures that I mentioned, those are gonna be preventative. But we currently have treatment too that can prevent long-term complications of untreated obesity and diabetes. So we're talking about prevention and we're talking about treatment. We can do both. Mm. Important information for our viewers. Dr. Rocio salas Whalen. thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, safety in the spotlight after some frightening high-profile incidents both in the air and on the tarmac. The safety of airplanes and flying here in the States, the FAA now stepping in more on the safety summit that's in the works. Plus, miracle on the Hudson. Captain Sully Sullenberger on what needs to be done to keep passengers and crew members safe on board. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. As we head into the spring break travel season, a series of aviation emergencies has a lot of passengers on edge. Just the past week, a flight attendant was allegedly attacked by a passenger trying to open an emergency door mid-flight. An engine caught fire on a plane, forcing it to make an emergency landing, and severe turbulence killed one person, severely injuring several others. Now the FAA is calling an aviation safety summit for next week. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello covers aviation for us. We've been keeping him busy this week. He joins us with more. Tom, good morning. Yeah, Joe, good morning. Let's just drill down on this. We've now had six, six runway close calls so far this year. We've just learned about the most recent. We'll get to that in just a minute. We've also had this incredible turbulence with people injured, one person killed, as you mentioned. We've had that bird strike, an engine blowing up, emergency landing in Cuba. And now the FAA is so concerned about what's been happening so far this year, this aviation safety summit set for next week. After months of high-profile close calls, the bird strike and engine fire on that southwest flight over Cuba has put a lot of people on edge. People were screaming, not knowing what to do, and they kept trying to breathe, and it was filling up with more smoke. Thankfully, the plane landed safely back in Havana. If you lose an engine, if you lose a computer system, you've got multiple fail-safes, right? Absolutely. I mean, you've got typically two to three different systems to back each other up. For each system? For each system. Mark Weiss is a former American Airlines captain. The airplanes are certified to fly on one engine. On one engine? On one engine. So that's not the issue. The emergency landing in Cuba followed two cases of severe in-flight turbulence. Seven injured last Thursday, a Lufthansa flight forced to divert to Washington, D.C. While on Friday, 55-year-old Dana Hyde killed in a private jet that hit severe turbulence, too. And multiple close calls on the nation's runways this year, including Burbank, California. You up the runway yet? We're going around. Austin, Texas. FedEx is on the go. New York's JFK. Delta 1943, cancel takeoff plans. And Honolulu. And that United Jumbo Jet that went into a steep nosedive off Hawaii in December, coming within 800 feet of slamming into the ocean. Now the FAA chief, himself a veteran pilot, is convening a nationwide safety summit next week. Pilots, controllers, airlines, unions, and regulators. I want to hear from the participants about what they are seeing in their own operations. And more important, I want specific ideas about how to enhance our already robust safety net with concrete actions. 
The pressing question, are these a string of coincidences, or is there an ongoing safety issue that needs to be addressed now? NTSB Chief Jennifer Hammondy. We really need to focus on, you know, what's going on in the aviation system. Let's take a pause. Let's do a safety stand down, and let's figure out what are we missing here. We mentioned that there was a sixth runway incursion. This one happened in February in Sarasota. Uh, the NTSB says one plane was cleared to land on a plane that another plane had already been cleared to take off from. And this became a very close call. NTSB believes this was likely an air traffic controller error. Joe, the question really is, is there an issue nationwide as it relates to staying on the money, on the job, and not getting complacent? Back to you. All right, Tom, thank you so much. And in response to the recent turbulence in the skies, retired U.S. Airways pilot Captain Sully Sullenberger is speaking out. You'll remember Sully successfully landed a plane in New York's Hudson River after losing both of his engines to a bird strike back in 2009. He now works as an aviation safety expert and was on the Today Show earlier this morning to talk about safety in the airline industry. And while all of these incidents are unrelated, he says they all point to a troubling trend. They are the canaries in the coal mine and they should concern us. There are indications that as, as good as a job as we've done in this complex system, there's always improvements that can be made and we still have work to do. Uh, two things that stand out for me right now that are long-term issues but we need to work on is the FAA and our other Im critically important infrastructure needs to be able to get from Congress predictable uh, long-term multi-year funding uh, so that we're not doing band-aids, but we take a long-term approach. And we need to have um, FAA administrators who are confirmed and not a series of acting administrators. Those two things alone in the long term would do a lot to, uh, to stabilize the system. Do you think there is a sense of complacency that sets in when, when air travel has been, thankfully, so safe? Yes, we become the victims of our own success. We must keep reminding ourselves on literally a daily basis that even though air travel has become ultra safe and routine, what we're really doing is pushing a tube filled with people through the upper atmosphere seven or eight miles above the earth at 80% of the speed of sound in a hostile environment with outside air temperatures to minus 70 and air pressure one quarter that at the surface. And we must return it safely to the surface every time. And during that interview, Captain Sully also pointed to the staffing shortages created by COVID-19 and called for more recruiting efforts to fill aviation support roles like air traffic controller and mechanics. Some financial news now. California breaking ties with Walgreens. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us once again for more on that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Good morning, Zinkley. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, so Walgreens is responding to California Governor Gavin Newsom, who says the state won't do business with the company days after the pharmacy chain said it won't dispense abortion pills in some Republican-led states. That includes states where abortion is legal, but Republican attorneys, attorneys general have warned Walgreens it risks breaking the law. Walgreens says it plans to dispense the pill in any jurisdiction where it's legal to do so and once it's been certified by the FDA. A Newsom spokesperson says all relationships between California and Walgreens are now under review. Google says fewer employees will receive promotions to more senior levels this year. In an email seen by CNBC, the company says it's increasing leadership roles in proportion with a wider employee base. Google has implemented a new performance review system, which will result in more employees getting low ratings and fewer getting high marks. Lego reporting sales topped $9 billion last year, outpacing rivals like Mattel and Hasbro, and despite facing higher costs for raw materials, energy, and shipping. Lego has enjoyed stellar growth throughout the pandemic as kids and adults turn to its iconic plastic bricks. It's expanded its product lineup and opened hundreds of stores. Lego will soon announce details of a collaboration with Epic Games, the maker of Fortnite, guys. And I know my nephew contributed to that because he's got <laughs> so many Lego sets. <laughs> I was going like, to say. Like a billion dollars worth, right? Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. fun. I've been to Legoland. I'm a fan. It's, it's kind of cool. Can't go wrong with it the is. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Silvana Hanau, thank you so much. You got it.
Jamie Lee Curtis has been pretty much everywhere this award season for her role in the critically acclaimed film Everything Everywhere All at Once. She even earned her very first Oscar nomination. But now she's making headlines for something else, a super early bedtime. Today's show anchor Savannah Guthrie has a look at her viral comments. Thank you. Hollywood stars, they're just like us. Even the one and only Jamie Lee Curtis, the Academy Award-nominated actress stunning America Saturday on the red carpet for the Independent Spirit Awards after she revealed the real reason why she declined an upcoming Oscar invite. There is a nominee's dinner, an Academy Award nominee's private dinner on Thursday night that starts at 7.30 and I have declined. Why? Because mommy goes to bed early and I just, because 7.30 is going to be nine before we get food. And you know what? There's nothing good happening with me after nine o'clock. Nothing. Zero. That's right. Jamie Lee Curtis does not like staying up late. Her lights out way early. Something we can all relate to. Jamie Lee Curtis, we salute you. Oh my gosh, I feel seen. I'm like, are we at a club in Ibiza? It starts at 7.30 p.m. Her comments now going viral on social media, bringing out all the fellow early risers. One user commenting, she is all of us. Even Shonda Rhimes chiming in, simply writing, preach. The 64-year-old actress proving mommy does not lie, posting this caption and picture on Instagram. Her lights clearly out at 6.58. Many now wondering, will she be able to stay up on Oscar night? Curtis, who's been in the business for 45 years, is nominated for her very first Academy Award this weekend for her role as a menacing IRS agent in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. You think this is funny? But she's already been taking this award season by storm, winning a SAG Award for Best Supporting Actress just last month. The truth of the matter is I'm 64 years old and this is just amazing. <laughs> and fervently supporting her co-stars, cheering them on at every ceremony. All of it proving it's never too late to fall in love with Jamie Lee Curtis. Our thanks to Savannah Guthrie for that reporting as we all look forward to cheering Curtis on this Sunday, March 12th at the Oscars. I think she's going to stay up late because I think she's the favorite to win. You know, we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there's more morning news now right after this. You may want to look up at the sky tonight for the last full moon of winter. It will reach peak brightness today, and like many other full moons, this one does have a name. It's called the Worm Moon. Why worm? Well, Native American tribes referred to it as that because it coincided with the spring emergence of, you guessed it, worms. So what better way to welcome the new season? The Worm Moon will be joined by three special guests as well. Venus and Jupiter will be at their closest positions in a decade, while Mars will be glowing in its usual red-orange in the southwest. So, Joe, feeling like a true party in the sky. You know, I love a pretty moon. I'm not so sure how I feel about the image of worms. <laughs> I mean, maybe they'll be me. doing the worm. You remember right. that dance yes. move? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you should do that. Yeah. Do the worm. Do the worm. Looking at the worm moon. Just don't take pictures of it with your phone because they don't work. It doesn't. It just doesn't land the same it. way. I exactly. agree. I All agree. Right. That does it for the shower morning news now. <laughs> the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.